Okay. This I think is this is um again. This is, this this doesn't have to be a long answer. The question I'm going to ask you now, and don't jump ahead. I'm going to ask you about what you told him to do when he stuttered. Okay. okay. But don't jump ahead. You know, just you know what I mean. We'll mm -hmm. we'll understand in in the story what happened. Okay. We have speed. We're rolling. Um. So so you know em Emmett stuttered, and what did you tell Emmett to do when he stuttered? When I found out that Emmett could memorize something and give it back to me perfectly, I turned to him one day and I said, Bo, when you start to, to stutter, I said, just whistle and go ahead and say what you're going to say. And that seemingly worked like a charm. I mean, he could whistle. He, he would, I guess he would regain his composure and he could go ahead and say what he wanted to say at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do one more time, but but if, if you could could for me, Mrs. Mobley, when, when you say whistle, you know whistle. Let let me hear hear. Oh, let me Lord, hear. I never could whistle. You can't whistle. <laughs> I, I'll you try. Can't, you can't whistle. All right, even even trying will be good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what did you tell Emmett to do um, when he started? I told him, when you find yourself getting hung up on a word, just whistle, and go ahead and say what you want to say. And that really kind of tickled him, but he tried to do it, and it really worked like a charm. Mm -hmm. And you, you got um, uh, after Emmett went went down south. Um, he wrote he wrote you back. I mean, you got uh, uh, letters, uh, um, and um, that that what what kind of time was he having down there? He wrote you and tell me what what he wrote. He was having a ball. He was uh, enjoying himself. And he was uh, uh, concerned about everyone back home. Tell them that he was having a good time and tell, tell them hello for him. And I thought he had asked me to send him his bike. Let, but, let, me, let me stop you one second. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mobley. Uh -huh. Because I, 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 let me ask you again. Because I, I need for you to, to say, you know, I got letters <coughs> from, from him. Oh, so okay. that we can use the letters. Just so that we have an idea of, of how you knew this. Okay. You know, that, 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 that Bo wrote me, wrote me letters and said mm -hmm. he was having a good time. Okay. We rolling? Yes. Okay. So, I, I, again, my apologies for, for interrupting you, but I'm sure I'll do it again before we're, we're through. Uh, um, so, you find out how Bo was doing, how, how that he was having a good time down, down south. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find out? Well, when he, Emmett was calling me, just whenever he felt like it, he would pick up the phone, and I discouraged that because that was a long-distance call. And I reminded him that he could write. And while he was at Papa Moses' house, he wrote me two letters. And uh, in these letters, he would tell me what a wonderful time he was having and uh, the things that they had done and the things they were looking forward to doing. And it seems like he wrote me one of these letters on a Friday and Saturday. He was supposed to be going to Uncle Crosby's house. And uh, somehow that got switched over to Sunday. They were going to leave Sunday after church instead. And of course, uh, before day Sunday morning, that's when the invasion took place. Mm -hmm. But had they gone Saturday, as they had purpose to do, uh, he would have been able to avoid this confrontation. I also saw a letter that 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 you had that, that from uh, 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 Mr. Wright, uh, Moses Wright. He wrote you a letter, too. Do you remember that? He's saying what a great boy uh, Emmett is. And I think that was Aunt Lizzie. That was Aunt Lizzie that wrote that letter. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. uh, let's cut for a second. Sure. Okay. Okay. We're not wrong. We're not ready yet. Everybody ready? I'm ready. Speak. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Moses. But it, tell me again how how Emmett got the ring. Um, a day before he left for Mississippi, I gave him his father's ring. And uh, when I gave it to him, he it really expressed a lot of excitement over getting Lewis's ring. And uh, he put it on his finger and it fitted because Emmett was kind of stocky. But it wasn't, it was a little bit loose on his finger, but not enough to hurt. And uh, he was 
he, you know, you would see him ever so often looking down at his hand. And uh, when he got ready to leave, when he departed from me at the police station, at the uh, train station, he said he was going to keep the ring and show it to his friends. Yes. Okay, let's cut. Okay. Okay, we're going to take a... Uh, Just a second, Seiko. Down there. <coughs> hmm? I'm trying to figure out how I can... Get it all in. Yeah. If you have to, that's fine. Okay, because I can... I no, no. I would, I would... Okay. Okay. Walden? Yes. Walden and my sense speed. I have lost where I'm supposed to start on oh, this one. Okay. Keep, keep mm -hmm. rolling. So you read the date, and then mm -hmm. it's, um, I was glad that you all let me Oh, know. it was way down I here. I was glad, right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Keep, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now, what is that that you're holding there? I'm holding a letter from my Aunt Lizzie. Uh, it's dated August 25th, 1955. Uh, from Greenwood, Mississippi. It says here, I was glad that you all let Bobo come. He is so, he is certainly a nice kid. He is just as obedient as you would want to see. A comment? What do you think about well, that? I know that he was helping her. He was not only working in the field, but he saw the load that my aunt was carrying, and he did what he could to lift that load for her. For instance, he would not go to the field in the morning with the rest of the boys and Papa Mose. He would stay and get the breakfast dishes washed up, go with her to the garden and pick the afternoon, the lunch meal, and come back to the house and help her get that ready. And uh, then when the boys came... This young man was being raised right. ...came in for lunch, he would go back with them in the afternoon. Because they would always rest a little bit after they ate. And that's when Bo would have a chance to help her get the dishes washed up and uh, whatever was left from the afternoon meal, they added to that for the evening meal. Okay, let's cut. Sure. Okay. We're rolling, so let me um let me ask you uh just to to, to start again. I'm sorry. We're not ready. Okay. We're not ready. But don't I you should probably just say that it's a letter that you received. Don't don't mention the other letter because mm -hmm. we may not have you read both. Okay. So if we only have All you read right. one, we just want you to say this is a letter that All right. This is a the the last letter that I received Okay, hold from... on one second. Uh, are you, are we okay, what I'm going to do is it, and move up, okay? In other words, instead of having that wide shot, mm -hmm. why don't you just let me start with the letter and then I see. see, okay? Okay, let's go. This is the last letter that I received from Emmett. And he said, Dear Mom, how is everybody? I hope you and Jean are fine. I have... Uh, I hope you all had a nice trip. I'm uh, having a real, I'm, I'm having, oh dear, I'm, you're going to have okay, to help me here. Okay, hold on, let's here. cut for a minute. Sure. This we're, okay, we're rolling. Speak. Okay, Mrs. Mullen. This is the last letter that I received from Emmett. And he said, Dear Mom, how are you, how is everybody? I hope you and Jean are fine. I hope you, I hope you all had a nice trip. I'm having a, I'm having a great time. We'll be home next week. Please have my motorbike fixed for me. And this was the uh, the letter that I received from him, and I had had to ask him, please start writing me and stop calling me, because when he called, he would call collect, and he didn't care how long he talked. So 
Oh, this was one of two letters that I received from him while he was visiting with Aunt Elizabeth and Papa Moses. Okay, that's good. Okay, we're going to roll. We're going to try this one again. Okay. August 25th. I'm sorry, if you could start again. You, you, you said before, you started before with, you know, this is the last letter I received. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Now, this is the last letter that I received from Emmett. It's dated August 25th, 1955. Dear Mom, how is everybody? I hope you and Jean are fine. I hope you'll, uh, I hope you all had a nice trip. I am having a fine time. Uh, we'll be home uh, next week. Please have my motorbike fixed for me. Uh, this is one of two letters that I received from Emmett. Uh, he was, we never lost communication because he was calling and I had to discourage the calling because he was calling collect and uh, or he didn't have any limit on the time he was using. So I uh, reminded him that, you know, you can write me a letter. And this was the second letter and the last letter that I received from him, which was probably on Saturday morning. And he was taken out of the house before day Sunday morning and uh, oh, I didn't hear about it until 9.30 Sunday morning. Great. Okay. Let's cut for one second. Um, one of the things I think that's important is that is that, for, is that as we go you, you let, let us know how you felt and how these things felt for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. But, you know, um, how did you first hear that Emmett was missing? I received a telephone call at 9.30 Sunday morning. It was from Moses Wright's oldest daughter, Willie Mae Jones, the mother of Curtis Jones. And uh, evidently she had received a call from Curtis uh, telling her what had happened. She called me. But she was so hysterical until I couldn't understand what she was saying. And I told her to hang up. And I called my mother, who lived close by, and asked her to go over and see what the world was wrong with Willie Mae. And my mother called me back to let me know that Bo had been kidnapped. Okay, great. at the moment what she'd be going through you know to hear that her son has been kidnapped can you just really imagine you know the space that she would be in um how did you feel when you heard that oh my goodness i don't really know how i felt i wasn't really frightened but i was very apprehensive i kind of thought these men whoever they were would take him and uh, give him a real good licking and bring him back to Papa Moe's. It never occurred to me that they would uh, kill him. But I jumped out of bed and I made up my bed. Then I called Gene. Uh, he lived about eight blocks away. And I said, Gene, I want you to take me to my mother's house. And uh, he had to either get public transportation, a cab, or a walk from where he lived to where I live. But it seemed that he got to me so quickly. Uh, but by the time he got there, I had notified Uncle Mac and Aunt Magnolia downstairs. I had called the news media, uh, every newspaper I could think of, and uh, I didn't call any TV stations, but they picked up the story. All I knew to do was call the newspapers. And the uh, Daily News wanted to talk to me at length 
And I told them to meet me at my mother's house, which was on the west side, gave them the address. When Jean got there, I was ready to go. And uh, Jean was stopping at every stop sign and stopping at every red light. And I didn't have time for that. I told him to move over, pull over. And Jean did what I asked him to do, and I took the wheel. And he said, oh, you're going to get a ticket. The police is going to stop you. I said, well, I hope they do. Then they can put the siren on and get me to Mama's house faster. Uh, because that, that, there was no stopping. I had to get to Mama. And when I got there, surely enough, the, def the uh, Chicago Daily News was there. They were waiting on the steps for me to arrive. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I, I know we talked about before <laughs> was how hard it was for you to get information out of Mississippi. Oh, for you to get, was... Talk about it, because then you had this great quote about comparing it to the Iron Curtain. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, talk about um, how hard it was for you to find out any information. Was it hard finding out information out of Mississippi? I didn't find out any information. I mean, every every place I called, it was a block there. They didn't know anything. Uh, the people that we knew personally, uh, they were they had to go to church. They couldn't help us with the situation. Uh, and I mean, everybody was preoccupied. I couldn't get the governor right away. I finally got him but I couldn't get the sheriff. It was almost mission impossible. It was uh, as if uh, Mississippi had been sealed off with an iron curtain. I mean, there was no information coming out of there whatsoever. Do you think that the people you knew, the black people there, were scared already? Do you think that they just didn't want to be involved or, or, or they just were, were preoccupied? Do you think they were scared? I didn't even call any black people for help. I was calling on white people that we knew. And uh, Mr. Macfall, he was quite a, uh, he was of renown in the neighborhood. And Mr. Macfall told me, he said, I'm sorry, I don't have time to look at that now. I'm on my way to church. And so he, I guess he went on to church. And everybody we called had something they had to do, and they could not change their plans. How did you first hear that they had found in its body? And how did you feel? I found from I found out from, uh, not United Press. What is the other one? Mm. Uh, one of the news agencies. Associated Press. Yes. Uh, one of the news agencies called, and they wanted to speak to somebody in the house except me. And I knew immediately what they had to, it was this, as if I had something telling me what was going to happen next. And I told him, I said, sir, there's no one in this house you can talk to except me. And I want you to just give me the news slowly so I can write it down. I don't want to make any mistakes. Well, he would not talk to me, Associated Press, that's who it was. And uh, he wanted to know, did I have any friends? And I gave him the name of my friend in Argo, Illinois, Ollie Williams. And he called her and gave her the story. She, in turn, called me back. Well, I was the one who was answering the phone. I was manning all the telephones. And uh, she wanted to speak to my mother. And I said, Ollie, the message you have, you cannot give it to my mother. You've got to give it to me. I said, Mama can't take it. And uh, I said, because I want details and nobody is going to take the details as I will. And she finally was persuaded to give me the message. And she described how his body had been found, how Moses Wright had identified him by the ring on his finger. And uh, 
she told me about the gin fan that was around his neck, wired with barbed wire around his neck and the other end to that huge gin fan. And he was thrown into the, into the Tallahatchie River. But by some accident, uh, he had become tangled with some undergrowth and the body couldn't continue to float down the river and the foot just went up. The, uh, one, one of his feet went up above the surface of the water. And there was a young white man, John Hodges, who was fishing with his dad. And he spotted that foot and he told... How would you feel if you out fishing one day and you discover a body. Oh, uh, his daddy, that there's somebody in the river. Well, the search for Emmett Till had become very intense. And uh, when the sheriff came down, he immediately sent for Moses Wright. And Moses Wright came, and he said that he couldn't tell it was Bo by looking at him. But when he saw the ring on his finger, he said, yes, that's him. That's his ring. And that is the way he identified Emmett. Mm -hmm. When your friend Ollie, Ollie was her name? Ollie Williams, yes. When your friend Ollie told you, how'd you feel? Oh, my God. Those words were like arrows sticking all over my body. And... Uh, I had had this visitation by this little white dove who had told me, I will lead you, I will guide you, I will take care of you. All you have to do is obey. And as Ollie was talking to me, I was trying to write and I would stop her ever so often because my eyes were so full of tears until I couldn't see and I needed to uh, clear my vision, and then I would go back to writing. And she was so reluctant to give me that information. She wanted to talk to my mother because my mother was the, uh, she was the, the force in the family. But I had looked at my mother and I realized that my mother, I was going, this is one thing I was going to have to do. Mother could not do this one for me. And when I began to make the announcement uh, that Emmett had been found uh, and how he was found, the whole house began to scream and to cry. And my mother fell prostrate on the floor. And uh, the people that were able to, they were around her. They had just sealed her in. And I stood up and went towards her. And as I approached her on the floor, I felt a surge of something like electricity coming from her to me. And I stepped back because it seemed that if I stayed there, I would zap all the life out of her body. So I moved back. And I began to tell the people, give her air, uh, get from around her, get her head up. I was telling them how to take care of mother. And that's when I realized that this was a load that I was going to have to carry. I wouldn't get any help carrying this load. Mm. You can't skip for a minute? Mm -hmm. Mike in, please. Okay, we're ready, Sandy. Okay. So, um, Emmett has passed away, and um, they, they actually tried to bury his body in, in Mississippi. Tell me that story. What happened? Yes, when the sheriff uh, summoned Moses Wright to the riverside, and when Papa Mose identified Bo by the ring on his finger, uh, Sheriff Strider gave the body to uh, told Moses Wright to take the body and it had to be buried before the sun went down that night. And uh, Moses Wright 
was very obedient. He took the body to the church cemetery. They had dug the grave, and they were preparing to put Emmett in the grave. When uh, Curtis spoke up and said, Granddaddy, are you going to bury Bo without talking to Mamie? And uh, that stopped them. They, they ceased operations. And he said, I need to call Mamie. And uh, his grandfather told him, if you can get a call through, go ahead and call her. And they waited to see what, would, uh, what Curtis would be able to do. But he went to home after home after home, mostly white homes in the area, and no one would allow him to use the telephone. Uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> uh, when we got the word, and I was able to get the house quieted down, I told them it's something we have to do, and I don't know what it is, and you're going to have to help me think. And... Uh, I was telling them how futile it was to be crying. I said, we don't have enough tears to cry for Emmett Till. The world will cry for Emmett Till. And uh, my aunt spoke up and she said, call the undertaker. Call A.A. A. Rayner. Well, we did that. And A.A. A. Rayner is the one that reached the uh, people, the right people in Mississippi and laid claim to the body. But he was very skeptical. He told he called back and he wanted to know, he said it's going to cost thirty three hundred dollars to get the body out of Mississippi. And he wanted to know could we pay it? And uh I told him, Mr Rayner, regardless to the cost, I want the body. I said if I live I'll pay you. If I don't live, somebody else will pay you. You will get paid. And uh, we, I was able to live up to that promise. Uh, when we buried Emmett, enough money had come through my hands that I was able to pay him in full, and I had about $250 left, which I put in a, a savings account. Let me let me just go back a little bit because I wanted to, to just kind of finish the story as it, as it was going on there in, in Mississippi um, so that the body, Emmett's body, him would have been buried in Mississippi. I mean, they were trying to bury his body in Mississippi. Yes, and they wanted to get it in the ground as quickly as possible. They didn't want nightfall. Um, so why do you think there was in such a big hurry? to bury the body? Was it law or was it covering up evidence? To catch that body unburied. And um, so, so, so really it was uh, Curtis, someone, one of your relatives who spoke up at, at, they were, they were actually, they had, had dug the grave and were about to put him in mm -hmm. and somebody spoke up. Yes. Uh -huh. That was Moses Wright's grandson, Curtis Jones. Mm -hmm. The one who said, Bobo said, bye baby which is, we have found out, that was untrue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they wanted to get the body in the ground so quickly? Oh, that's obvious. The way that body had been mutilated, they didn't want anybody to see what what those devils had done. Uh, the, uh, that was something to be hidden. It was not to be advertised. It was not to be photographed. It was not to be even heard of anymore. Just bury this body and let's get on with our lives. Okay. Um, I think we should we should stop for a minute and, and think about this. Was a, something I read that you said that they were digging a shallow grave that they were going to dig. Do you, so do you think that they were going to actually leave the body in that grave or do you think they were going to dig it up and get and get rid of Emmett's body? I just really don't know. I have no answers for that at all. But I do know that they wanted that body in the ground as quickly as possible. They didn't want any fanfare about it at all. Okay, great. And they had no intention of letting the body out of Mississippi. What do you mean? They were not, they, shipping that body to Chicago 
uh, was not something they intended to do. And it took the intervention of a white undertaker that A.A. A. Rayner communicated with. And he, in turn, went to the black uh, undertaker who was a subsidiary of his, uh, they had a white and a black branch. And it was through the white owner that we got the body on the train. I was told that the train wouldn't take the body because of the odor. And, oh, I was told a lot of impossible things. But I didn't waver. I said, I want the body. I want the body. And when the body arrived at 12th Street Station, I went down to receive the body. And to my surprise, there were hundreds of people there. And when I looked up and saw this huge box, it, it, it was almost as if the box crushed me to the ground. And uh, one of the things that was foremost on, on my mind, I wanted to see. Uh, I had to see what was in the box. And it was then that I was told about the uh, affidavits that had been signed, the Mississippi seal that was on the big box, the box inside that one, and the third box that housed the casket. All of these had seals and padlocks on them. And it was not to be opened. And uh, Mr. Rayner tried to explain to me that he would be in trouble with the Mississippi authorities if he opened the box. And I didn't care anything about the Mississippi authorities. I wanted to get in the box. And when he just told me he couldn't do it, I reflected a moment and I asked him, Mr. Rayner, do you have a hammer? And that kind of startled him. Uh, and he wanted to know, what are you going to do with the hammer? I said, I haven't signed anything, and I haven't made any promises. And if you can't open those box, that box, I can, because I'm only expecting one box with a casket inside. But there was a box within the big box, and then another box was inside the second box, and then the casket was inside the third box. And uh, oh, when... Uh, when we, when Mr. Rayner agreed to go into the box, that's when we found all of these other padlocks, four padlocks in all, and every one with the Mississippi seal on it. Okay, let's cut for a second. Okay. Okay. On tape eight. Okay, um, Ms. Mulley, how did, um, Tell me again about about the uh, the casket arri arriving with 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 all these seals on it. Yes, uh, we went to the train station, uh, the 12th Street station, Illinois Central, and uh, we were waiting for the box for the for the body to be brought into the area where we were, and all of a sudden I looked up and there was this huge box. It looked almost, well, it looked almost as if it were the size of a freight car. And uh, a, a really ugly box, but so big. And I wondered, why such a huge box? And uh, I later found out that it was one of three boxes. Because there was a box inside the huge box. And the, the huge one had a seal and a padlock on it. The box inside it had a seal and a padlock. The third box had a seal and a padlock. And inside the third box was the casket with the seal and a padlock. And I was told that the only way the body was released to come to Chicago was that affidavits were signed and promises would, were made that the box would not be opened. And, uh, of course, I objected to that immediately. I mean, uh, when I went up uh, 
when I saw the casket, it seems as if uh, during that time between then and the time I actually looked over in the casket to see what Bo looked like, I had a sensation that every bone had turned to steel. And I looked, I mean, the, the uh, sensation was so intense until I looked at myself to see could I see the physical changes that were taking place in my body. And uh, my father and Jean were on either side of me to hold me up. And I told them, turn me loose. I said, I, I'm not going to faint now. I've got a job to do. I've got to try to figure out what this is. And uh, they had, when I looked inside the casket, all I saw was a huge something in a body bag with a lot of white pellets all over the body, all in the bag. And I told Mr. Rayner, I said, I can't see what's in the box. All, I mean, you're going to have to wash it off so I can see it. Well, they were very patient with me. They took the body to the back of the casket of uh, the funeral parlor where they dress the bodies, where they present them, get them ready for presentation. And uh, they took him out of the body bag and they washed him off and they called me back and let me look at him there. And when I glanced at his face, I had to turn away. I just couldn't look him in the face. And I remember I started at his feet and I checked uh, certain checkpoints all the way up until I got to his neck. But one thing I observed was that he had not been castrated. He was all there. But that rumor has persisted that he was castrated and his uh, intimate parts stuffed in his mouth. Well, that was not true. Uh, thank okay, God that was not true. Okay, let's cut for one second. Okay. Uh, Roberts. Okay, and that's you. You're now Yes, I'm in the chair. In a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. um, um, I quite, um, so... So you see this big. You're still at the train station. Let's let's talk, tell that story, and then then we'll then we'll tell the other story of the funeral. So you're at the train station. You see this huge, you know, uh, uh, box come mm -hmm. come off the train, and you know there's there's a bunch of pictures of you, and and you, you seem to be breaking down. How did you feel? I felt that that box was on top of me, crushing me to the ground. I felt the weight of that box. And I just, I was not prepared to see anything so huge. And I had no idea how I would feel when I ob observed what he was returned to me in. I just did, I was totally unprepared for that. And, and when you went to the funeral home, my understanding is you went to the funeral home, uh, you know, with, with the box and, and they opened the box. And didn't Rainer tell you not, say that, ask you not to look? What oh, yes, they did want me to look. But I had to look because I had to be sure that I was going to bury Emmett. I mean, even, uh, you know, with $3,300 staring me in the face, I didn't want to bury nothing or somebody else. I wanted to make sure that I was burying Emmett. And that was the uh, the whole idea behind seeing what was in the box. Because I realized they could have filled it with bricks. They could have put mud in it. It could have been somebody else's body. I had to know for sure. And so tell me the story again in, in the funeral home. So what, what Ray, didn't, I thought Rainer said, you know, please don't look. Did, did he say something like that? And then... You, you went ahead and looked, and what, did he ask you not to look? Yes, I, uh, I was, even my father didn't want me to look. Nobody wanted me to look at Emmett, but I had to look at Emmett. I mean, how he looked was not the issue. I had to make sure I had Emmett, mm -hmm. and that was the only way I could be sure. 
Describe to me, um, can you, you want some water? Maybe? maybe? You, you want I some? think my water. Is oh. It, uh, Mike, right? mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you're at the, at Rainer's funeral home and, and they, they ask you not to look, but you insisted on looking. Mm -hmm. Um, describe what you saw when you opened, when you opened the casket. Describe what you saw when you looked. Well, as I said, I started at his feet. And there were little things that I could identify on my way up to his head. Uh, because after all, I'd been bathing him for a long time. Uh, I had to stop at age five. He would let me bathe him after age five. So when I paused at his midsection, I, I got a little jolt because I knew he would not want me looking at him. Uh, but I saw enough that I knew he was intact. In fact, there were very few blemishes on his body until you got to his neck. And all of the scarring, all of the beating was about his head. And uh, I saw that his tongue was choked out and it was way down below his chin. And it was such a big tongue. I didn't know human beings had tongues so big. And uh, as I came on up, I noticed that there was a, the right eye was lying on midway his cheek. And I noticed that his nose had been broken like somebody took a meat chopper and chopped his nose in several places. I looked for this eye and it was gone. Uh, just as if somebody had picked it out with a net picker. And I went back to examine his ears because his ears were not attached to his face and the end of it curled up a little bit. And uh, I couldn't find the ear. I only found a portion of an ear. And I wanted to know where is that? As I kept looking, I saw a hole, which I presumed was a bullet hole, and I could look through that hole and see daylight on the other side. And I wondered, was it necessary to shoot it? Oh, uh, it seemed like that was the final insult, the uh, shot through the head. But I also noticed that the fore part of his face and the back of his head were separated. They had come down over his head with a, a not an ax, but a hatchet. That's what Willie Reed, I think Willie Reed said that. And uh, the front of the face and the back of the head were in separate pieces. And Mr. Rayner uh, asked me, he said, do you want me to touch the body up? I said, no, let the people see what I've seen. I said, America needs to know what is going on in the South. And uh, I turned to Jean. I said, Jean, what are your thoughts? He said, well, that's Bo, all right. He said, because I'll never forget his head. He said, and I gave him that haircut. Jean was his barber. So not only did I have my verification, I had genes as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we okay? I'm just saying you're, you're right here, so you could oh, you're about to I'm keep the sorry. track on. So get the mic okay. closer. You okay? Great. Yes. Okay. Um, let's, um, well, I wanted you to just uh, just go back a little bit and and because I, I know one, one one thing we talked before you, you you talked a little bit more about about how you kind of looked from his I just wanted you to talk about how you looked from his feet and his and those his knees you recognize mm -hmm. you know kind of up until you get to 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 his up to his neck I All think right. just a little bit more on, on that but it doesn't have to be long All um, right. so Can I come wider and yeah, then move sure. in if I need to. Oh sure, we established the frame. Okay, yeah, you could right. So when so when you looked, um, uh, so you insisted on looking. Did did you start? You know, at the face. Where did you start? I started at Emmett's feet. 
I had glanced his face and I had to turn away. Uh, and when I turned away, I decided I would start at his feet and I would uh, examine him uh, all the way up until I got to the face. And one thing, I noticed his ankles. Uh, he had, uh, his ankles were very, very sharp. And uh, I noticed the sharpness of those angle, ankles. Okay, let's cut. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're going to start over. I'm sorry, man. Um, so, again, did, did, did you start at the face? No. When I glanced in his face, I had to turn away. I could not uh, focus on his face. And I decided then that I would start at his feet and work my way up, uh, maybe gathering strength as I went. And when I got to his ankles, I noticed those little sharp bones in his ankle. Okay, that was Emmett's ankle. And I came on up his leg until I got to his knee. And his knees were like my knees. He didn't have knobby knees. A lot of people have knobby knees, but he had flat knees. And uh, I said, those are his knees. And I came on up to his midsection and I just paused long enough to note that he was still intact. Nobody had uh, castrated him or anything like that, as the rumors had had it. And uh, I kept on up until I got to his chin. And then I, I was forced to deal with this face. And that's when I noticed his tongue hanging below his chin. And uh, I noticed that the, the size of the tongue, it was unbelievable. It was bigger than the tongues that my mother used to cook, the beef tongues that my mother used to cook. And I was amazed that a human being's tongue would be so big, but I don't know if that was due to uh, the body being waterlogged or what it was. But I moved on up from the chin until I got, I saw the eye that was lying, uh, dangling from the eye socket and about halfway the right cheek. And I looked on the other side and that eye was completely out as if it had been picked out. I noticed the bridge of his nose, which had been, it looked as if it had been chopped. And from there, I went to look at his ear, the right ear, because I was on the right side. And I noticed that the part of the ear that I was looking for was missing. And I wondered, where is his ear? And I couldn't uh, identify the ear because it was non-existent. But I saw this bullet hole around the temple area, and I could see daylight through the bullet hole. And I wondered why, was it really necessary to shoot him? Because by then he should have been dead. Uh, that body wouldn't, he, he wouldn't be able to take all of that punishment and yet be alive. But I also noticed that the front of his face and the back of his head had been chopped with something like a, a hatchet. And the, the face and the back of the head were separated. Now there's a picture that was taken by Jet Magazine. And on the left side, you can see all the thread they used to sew the back of the head and the face back together to make it one unit. And uh, Mr. Rayner asked me, he said, uh, do you want me to touch the body up? I said, no, Mr. Rayner, let the people see what I've seen. Uh, I, I was just willing to bear it all. I think everybody needed to know what had happened to Emmett Till. And, uh, but when I came back that evening, I was amazed at how much better he looked than when I had seen him. The eye was gone, the tongue was back in his mouth, his mouth was all 
hooked out like a, like he, well, it was all, it was protruding. Uh, I saw the stitches on the side where they had sewn him back together. And I turned to Mr. Rayner, I said, Mr. Rayner, you have done a beautiful job. And he looked at me, but from what I had seen previously, he had done a beautiful job. So we need to change tapes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Let the world see what they have done to my son. Those are some powerful, powerful words. You have just listened to part one of Mamie Teal.